So thank you very much, and it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, thank you, Sven and Christian, for this uh, invitation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this controversial hypothesis which tries to link autism with, uh, with our, our sex, our gender. Before I start, I'm going to acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, the work you're going to hear about uh, uh, involves teams, and we have uh, many names up here. Uh, at the top, we've got uh, psychologists and also people working with imaging, MRI. Uh, and at the bottom, uh, scientists working at the level of biology, particularly uh, hormones. Sven mentioned testosterone, and you'll hear a bit later in the lecture about our research in that area, and also genetics. So, by way of background, um, this is just to remind you about the diagnosis of autism spectrum conditions, uh, that the diagnosis rests uh, on the presence of two features. The first are social and communication difficulties, and the second are these rather unusual narrow interests, sometimes called obsessions, although I think the term is uh, a little pejorative, uh, but the, the person becomes very focused on a, a, a single topic and goes into it very deeply. Uh, and also that the, the individual uh, likes routines and becomes very distressed or stressed by uh, unpredictability, uh, instead wanting strong routines in their life. And when these two features interfere with the person's functioning, they might need a diagnosis on the autistic spectrum. And at the moment, we recognize two subgroups, so classic autism and Asperger's syndrome. I say at the moment because some of you may know that the plans for DSM, uh, either next year or the year after, uh, Sven and I were just discussing this over coffee, uh, is to uh, delete this second subgroup so that there's a single... Uh, a single category called autism spectrum conditions. But currently, we recognize at least these two major subgroups, uh, and they differ in terms of language and in terms of IQ. So in Asperger's syndrome, when you take a developmental history, uh, the child spoke on time. Language was developing at the, the typical rate. Uh, and in Asperger's syndrome the individual has at least average IQ, intelligence, uh, or even above. Uh, whereas in classic autism, invariably the child was late to talk when you take a history. They didn't have single words by two years old. Uh, and uh, their IQ could be anywhere on the scale, including in the range for learning difficulties. Uh, so that's how they differ, but they both share the same diagnostic features. And you see in brackets here the sex ratio, which is the impetus for this research question, uh, that in classic autism it's four boys for every one girl. Asperger's syndrome, if, uh, as many as nine boys for every one girl get the diagnosis. This could reflect uh, diagnostic practice uh, and uh, it could, ref could reflect... Uh, our difficulties in making accurate diagnosis, particularly in females, but it could also be telling us something about the underlying biology, uh, particularly sex-linked biology as, as part of the, the cause of autism spectrum. And you can see that these days we recognize about 1% of the population uh, have uh, autism spectrum condition. So let me move now to the topic of sex differences, because for a long time uh, this topic was taboo uh, within psychology. Uh, researchers uh, tried to avoid the topic, uh, and if sex differences came up at all, uh, they were dismissed as being purely the result of culture, purely the result of, of postnatal experience. Um, so I'm going to start the topic of sex differences by looking at the brain rather than behavior, and then move to behavior in a minute. So this first slide is simply showing 
differences, uh, first of all, in brain volume between typical boys and girls. So boys in blue and girls in red. And this is simply showing that, on average, there are differences in total brain volume. But the other thing you can see here uh, is differences in the rate of growth of the typical male and female brain, that uh, in females, in girls, um, the brain is reaching its peak um, volume at an earlier age to boys. It's about a one-year difference. So we can see differences in total size, but also in rate of growth. Uh, if you take apart those differences in total brain volume, you can see the differences in both grey and white matter, differences in total volume. Uh, but again, we, s we see the same pattern, that in girls, they're reaching their peak slightly earlier than boys. So girls are developing faster. Total size may not be particularly important, but rate of growth may be very important in terms of understanding developmental disabilities. And uh, if we look lobe by lobe, I'll just show you uh, here the frontal lobe and here the temporal lobe, we see the same pattern. Um, so you have to look at each lobe differently because uh, the rate and the size uh, is different lobe by lobe. But we see the same pattern, that girls are developing faster when it comes to, to, to brain development. So this is really just by way of... Uh, of structural brain differences between the sexes. Um, and many of you don't need any persuasion that there are differences between males and females. But I thought I'd start at the level of the brain to go gently into sex differences into psychology. Still at the level of the brain, you can look at individual structures, so not just lobes, but particular structures, and find sex differences. These are just two by illustration. Uh, in females, the planum temporale uh, involved with language is larger, on average, uh, than in males. And the amygdala shows the opposite uh, pattern, being larger in males, uh, at least in, in childhood. So uh, these are showing that um, regions that are associated with specific functions the amygdala, of course, being quite complex, but associated with emotion processing, and as we'll see later, with recognizing emotions in others, seems to show a sex difference. Some researchers, as you may know, have used functional MRI to look at sex differences, and found even within the amygdala, uh, there are sex differences um, showing laterality effects. So, for example, um, when subjects are asked to remember emotional stimuli, uh, women show more activity in the left amygdala and, uh, and men show more in the right. This is the work of Larry Carhill and colleagues from several years ago. So there are differences in both brain structure and brain function in terms of average sex differences. A final example of, uh, of neural sexual dimorphism comes from looking at neurotransmitters. And uh, I thought this slide was really quite dramatic in showing uh, that males produce much more serotonin than females. This, these are studies using PET, positron emission tomography, where you deplete the brain of serotonin and then look at the rate of synthesis of this, ser of this neurotransmitter. So I, I think uh, the idea that there are differences in the brain between males and females uh, should no longer be a topic of controversy. And the question really is, what is its importance, its significance, and how does it come about? So now I move to the level of behavior, uh, because this is where it's been much more controversial. Many of you know that one way to study sex differences in behavior has been to look at children during play and particularly to use this paradigm uh, called spontaneous toy choice. Uh, so this is where you put toys out on the carpet uh, and you videotape the children and later code the videotapes to see how often the child spontaneously chose 
to play with one kind of toy or another. And there are literally hundreds of studies of, these, of this kind uh, conducted in different cultures. Uh, and I'm going to summarize by saying that most studies show that boys, um, on average, show uh, a stronger preference to play with this cluster of toys, toy vehicles, like toy cars, uh, toy trains, and uh, uh, other vehicles, or constructional toys like Lego or building blocks. The studies range from about one year of age through to five years of age, showing a consistent sex difference on average. And girls, on average, are showing uh, a different spontaneous preference, which is to play with dolls, uh, not just playing with them, but creating social stories, often with emotional content. Uh, on the right of this slide, you can see one example from Melissa Hines, uh, who was in London at City University. She's recently moved to Cambridge. Uh, and uh, what this is showing is that when you look at the masculine-type toys, like the toy car, it's not that one sex plays with it and the other one doesn't. We simply see differences on average. So males spend more time relative to females um, playing with these masculine-type toys. Uh, and so these are just differences on average. And with the feminine-type toys, like the toy doll, we see the opposite profile. And it's important just to underline what I guess is obvious, uh, namely that these differences just apply on average. You can always find individual boys and girls that are atypical for their sex. So all we're seeing is differences on average. Melissa Hines used that same spontaneous toy choice method to look uh, at sex differences outside of um, human, the human species, to look at other primates. Uh, here, um, vervet monkeys. And uh, what you can see in this photo is a snapshot from her group studies showing that male monkeys spend more time playing with the toy car uh, and female monkeys spend more time, on average, uh, playing with the doll, uh, suggesting that whatever the role of culture and, uh, and experience in the human case, there might be some element of biology uh, independent of culture that contributes to these sex differences in, in behavior. Back to humans. Another way to look at sex differences in is in terms of sex ratios in occupations. Here I'm getting into territory which is even more controversial. So I'm going to try and go carefully. Um, but if we look at the, the ratios in many cultures, I'd be interested to know how it is in Sweden, uh, there is a, there's a cluster of occupations which are more likely to be filled by men than women. So this, is, this includes mathematics, computer science, physics, engineering, tool making. If we take just the first of those, in many cultures where it's been looked at, uh, the sex ratio is at least three quarters male uh, to uh, a quarter female. So an engineering has got a very similar sex ratio. Um, my own experience um, working in a, a university that, um, that prioritizes mathematics and physics and engineering is that the admissions policies are very much striving towards encouraging more women into these, these disciplines uh, as academic subjects but also professions. But that despite the effort to attract more women, these sex ratios remain skewed. Uh, there's another cluster of occupations uh, which shows the opposite profile. More women than men end up in these occupations. That includes primary school teaching and counseling. Uh, if we look just at uh, this data here, this comes from the SAT math test from the US, the test that's the entrance examination into university. And what it's showing is year by year, from 1972 to 1997, males and females. Um, what we don't see here are the standard deviations, but there's a significant difference 
uh, between males and females on this particular subtest, just for mathematics, despite fluctuations year by year. So it looks like it's not just uh, choice of occupation, but also performance on some tests, uh, aptitude tests, uh, showing these sex differences. I want to um, just mention caveats to this, this, uh, uh, this kind of data, which is that we know that uh, whatever occupation you end up in is not simply the result of spontaneous choice. So unlike the child play data that we looked at earlier, where we can talk about spontaneous choice, obviously with adult occupations, there are many factors that will influence uh, the field you end up in. But it's tempting to look at these uh, child and, hu and adult profiles, sex ratios, and suggest that maybe what we're seeing is that in, in males, attention uh, is more easily attracted by systems of one kind or another. Mechanical systems, constructional systems, uh, and in females, on average, attention is more easily attracted by people and particularly the emotional lives of other people and that we may be seeing that same uh, contrast uh, between uh, what Sven earlier mentioned as uh, an interest in systems uh, being stronger on average in males and an interest in people and particularly uh, the emotional lives of other people being stronger on average in females. I guess Sven is doing something systematic here. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so you, you were worrying about the, the l battery life of the computer. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to, in the next part of the lecture, ex explore this hypothesis, uh, looking at sex differences in these two psychological processes, empathy and systemizing, so asking the question, are there sex differences uh, in favor of females in empathy uh, and in favor of males in terms of systemizing? And uh, this hypothesis that maybe people with autism have an extreme of the typical male profile, we can ask, uh, are people with autism showing this particular profile on these psychological tests? First of all, in terms of definitions, empathy is a word we use all the time. Uh, my definition of it is, recognizes two components. That first is the recognition element, being able to identify another person's thoughts and feelings. So I would see that as synonymous with what's also called theory of mind, or mind reading, being able to imagine someone else's thoughts and feelings. The second element is the response element, having an appropriate emotional response uh, to somebody else's thoughts and feelings. So empathy is an umbrella concept uh, with at least two components and probably more. Systemizing is a very different kind of process. Uh, I've defined it as the drive to analyze or build a system, any kind of system. And you can see I've listed some of the more common types of systems that are around us in the environment. Mechanical systems like this computer, abstract systems like mathematics, natural systems like the weather, uh, collectible systems like a library. Uh, the thing about systems is that they follow rules and when you're systemizing you're trying to identify the rules that govern the system so you can predict how the system works. So, back to autism, uh, one uh, possibility is that some aspects of the symptoms we see in autism may be uh, the result of below average empathy, and particularly um, this might apply to the social and communication difficulties, and the difficulties uh, taking other people's perspectives. Uh, and the other side of autism may be the result of intact or even above average systemizing. Uh, and this may particularly apply to why they develop very narrow interests in systems, why they have a preference for predictability and routine, 
um, because uh, uh, when you systemize, um, you're trying to understand a predictable system, lo a lawful system, and why they might resist change, because when you systemize, you need to hold everything constant and just vary one thing at a time in order to understand the system. So what's the evidence? So I'm starting here with uh, one of our psychological tests of empathy. Many of you will have seen it before. It's called the eyes test. Uh, it's, uh, in this version, um, designed for adults in the general population, where you look at the photograph of someone else's eyes, and you're asked to pick which of these four words best describes what the person in the photo is thinking or feeling. Here the correct answer is dispirited, that she's a little bit sad. And if you got the answer correct, you did this on the basis of really quite minimal information about emotional expression just from the eye region of the face. Uh, the task was designed to be deliberately challenging in order to uh, test for sex differences that might be quite subtle. And what we see here is that uh, men and women in the general population on, av on average, here's the mean and the standard deviation, show small but statistically significant sex differences. So on this f uh, test, there were 25 such photographs. Both sexes were doing well, performing above chance uh, in this quite challenging test, but uh, women were scoring slightly but statistically significantly higher than men. Uh, here's a gr group of adults with Asperger's syndrome who are scoring significantly lower than the other two groups. And part of what I want to draw attention to is this pattern that we see a sex difference on the psychological test, and we see that people on the autistic spectrum, despite good IQ and the fact that these are adults who've had the opportunity to learn, are showing an extreme of the typical male profile. Another way to measure empathy is in terms of questionnaires. This is the empathy quotient, the EQ. Um, so it's a different methodology, but it reveals a similar, a similar pattern of results. Here, you read each statement, and you say whether you agree or disagree with each statement as a description of you. So all of the items are to do with social sensitivity, how easily you can pick up on other people's thoughts and feelings, or judge what is socially appropriate in different situations. Uh, once again, what we see is that women in the adult population, females are scoring higher than males, uh, and people with Asperger's syndrome, according to self-report, these are questionnaires that adults can fill in for themselves, but people on the autistic spectrum are scoring significantly lower than the other two groups. I've included here um, uh, just some data from about 4,000 people who took this online. Uh, so we have the opportunity to get large samples. And you can see it produces a relatively normal distribution, which is uh, a new idea that empathy is on a spectrum, just like uh, many traits, uh, and that most of us are just average uh, in terms of empathy, uh, but some people might be above average and uh, others very low in empathy. And uh, there are sex differences in this too. Let's quickly switch to systemizing to see the other side of uh, the, uh, the, the other psychological process. Here we've got a test um, where it, you're asked to understand or predict how a mechanical system works. Uh, the items for this test were selected for, from an entrance examination into engineering for adults in the general population. Uh, let me just quickly show you that on this item, the wheel rotates anti-clockwise, and you're asked uh, what will happen to this point P. And the correct answer is C. It's a multiple choice uh, that it will go back and forth. Some of you saw the answer very quickly. Um, and what we see here is that when tests like this are given to men and women in the general population, men score higher than women on average. There's the mean, and in brackets, the standard deviation. Um, up here, we've got some data from 
uh, children with Asperger's syndrome and a control group who don't have the diagnosis. And what you can see is that the group with Asperger's syndrome scored higher than those without the diagnosis. This is a, a striking result when I tell you that uh, the group with the diagnosis were chronologically younger than the group without. So here these children with Asperger's syndrome were aged 7 to 11 years old, taking a physics test um, in mechanics um, and uh, using material that they hadn't been taught at school. Uh, the control group were teenagers uh, in my home city of Cambridge who uh, were aged 12 to 16 years old. Uh, there were 20 items in this test. And you can see that the typical teenagers were struggling with this test. So it's reminding us about something that's becoming more familiar, that uh, here autism or Asperger's syndrome is a disability when it comes to understanding the social world, but isn't always a disability when it comes to understanding the physical world and can even lead to precocious uh, ability or islets of ability uh, or talents. Questionnaires can also be used to look at systemizing. So now the format is the same, but all the items in the questionnaire uh, gauge how strong your interests are in different systems. We've got uh, one about a mechanical system, another about an electrical system, and it's self-report in the adult version. We have other versions of this where parents can fill it in about their child, but I'm just showing you the adult versions, uh, where now men score higher than women in the general population. Um, I hope that was a deliberate decision to turn out the lights. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, here we see adults with Asperger's syndrome scoring even higher than men and women in the general population. Questionnaires, of course, have their limitations. There might be um, some, uh, some, some differences between the genders in terms of how they respond to questionnaires. But in conjunction with the performance tests, we seem to be seeing uh, a pattern where people with Asperger's syndrome or autism are showing an extreme of the male profile. Some people have argued that systemizing may be secondary to attention to detail, that when you're trying to understand a system, whether it's mathematics or uh, a, a mechanical system, we'll just ignore the, uh, the electrical lighting system. Um, what you have to do is pay attention to all the small details. <laughs> Uh, so here we've got a test which has been used by psychologists for over half a century. It's called the embedded figures test, where you have to find the target shape as quickly as you can in the overall design. Uh, and what you see is that men in the population, on average, are faster at finding this cube hidden in the overall design. There's the front of the cube, and there it's receding into 3D. Uh, this is the average number of seconds it takes to find the shape. That men are taking about 46 seconds, women about 66 seconds on average. Uh, and people with Asperger's syndrome are even faster and more accurate on this test of attention to detail, uh, taking on average only 30 seconds, 32 seconds. So um, the important point here is that, again, we're seeing this pattern of females... Uh, being uh, greater than males in terms of duration in this case, and people with Asperger's syndrome uh, being even quicker than typical males. So sometimes uh, the results are the opposite, but still showing the same pattern. Um, and this is a pattern that we can look at, uh, both in terms of psychological tests and also um, at the level of the brain. <laughs> I don't think this is me pushing the buttons, but uh, we can continue. It's fine. Good. <laughs> uh, we'll just um, try to ignore the, the stroboscope effects. <laughs> so what I've put up here is uh, a model, just to take a, take a moment of summary, that we've, we're talking about two different dimensions, empathy along one dimension 
systemizing along another dimension. And what we're finding is that, on average, uh, more females are scoring in this light blue area where empathy is at a higher level than systemizing. Uh, on average, uh, more males are scoring in this light pink area where their systemizing is at a higher level than their empathy. Obviously, there are many people who score in the middle area, this white area, where their empathy and their systemizing are at an equivalent level, showing no discrepancy, equally good or, or equally bad on these tests. But people with autism seem to be falling uh, down here, where their empathy is below average. If we imagine zero means average for the population, and minus one, minus two, minus three, uh, increasingly below average. Uh, but their systemizing could be anywhere from average through to superior. So when we, mo when we model these two dimensions in this way, the idea is we all fall somewhere in this space, uh, but people with autism may be um, an extreme along this dimension, this diagonal of sex differences. Well, that's the model. Here we can look at it in terms of actual data, where we've asked people to take both questionnaires, the EQ for empathy and the SQ for systemizing. In red are women in the population. Uh, in blue are men in the population. And in green are people with Asperger's syndrome uh, or on, uh, 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 with a diagnosis on the autistic spectrum. And the data is not as clean as the model, uh, but I think you might be able to see that the red dots cluster more up here the blue down here, and the green are clustering here. The important point from this slide is the variability and the individual, di the individual differences, just to guard against stereotyping. So you can always find uh, individual men who are as empathic uh, as women, and similarly, individual women who are as systemizing as men. And the conclusion from this kind of uh, uh, scatter plot is that you can't predict anything about an individual based on their gender. Nevertheless, if we look at the group statistics, we can see this trend coming out. So here we can do a count of all those dots. And if we look at different profiles, empathy greater than systemizing, for example, we find more women than men show that profile, 44% versus 17%. The opposite profile, systemizing at a higher level than empathy, now we see more men than women, 54% versus 17. And if we take this extreme, uh, where empathy is below average and systemizing is at least intact, if not above average, this is where we see the majority of people on the autistic spectrum. So um, the, the data is uh, in the direction predicted by the model. Quickly jumping to imaging, uh, if we're looking for this pattern uh, where people with autism are showing an extreme of uh, the typical male pattern, uh, on the eyes test using fMRI, um, we see that women show more activity uh, bilaterally in this area of uh, inferior frontal gyrus, but particularly on the left side. And people with autism show even less activity in that same region. Here the brain is switched over so that uh, right is left. But we're seeing that same pattern uh, f um, in terms of brain activity whilst they're taking an empathy test. In terms of the embedded figures test, that test of attention to detail, again we see that pattern. Females showing more activity than males in uh, parietal cortex, it's at the back of the brain, uh, posterior parietal, parietal cortex whilst they're searching for the target shape hidden in the overall design. And people with autism show even less activity in that same region despite having better performance on the task. So the fMRI data uh, are also showing that pattern of autism being an extreme of the male brain. And some people uh, have looked at resting state data uh, in terms of fMRI, the so-called default mode network, um, and particularly looking uh, at, uh, at this network um, connected 
um, uh, whilst you're doing nothing with your eyes closed. Uh, and many of the same regions involved in understanding other minds are also activated when you're simply um, instructed to do nothing. But there's a sex difference in this resting state um, network, females showing more activity than males, and people with autism showing even less activity in that uh, network of regions. So all of this talk about sex differences does raise the old question about how much of this uh, could be attributed to postnatal experience and culture. And it, for us to address this question, we decided to conduct a study of newborn babies um, we wanted to, te to test whether any of these psychological sex differences were evident at birth. And if we found any, then whatever the role of postnatal experience, uh, we would be pushed to conclude that prenatal biology was also important. So here we tested just over 100 babies aged 24 hours old. We asked the mothers for their consent um, so the babies had uh, just arrived and the babies were filmed awake whilst they were either looking at a human face or at a mechanical mobile. Uh, and each stimulus was presented for one minute and then later the videotapes were coded for how long the baby looked at each object. And what we're presenting here are uh, the percentage of babies that looked longer at one kind of stimulus or another. Um, so if I jump straight to the results, what we see is more boys than girls, 43% versus 17%, looked longer at the mechanical mobile. And in girls, uh, more girls than boys, 36% versus 25%, looked longer at the human face. The fact that this was uh, aged 24 hours old suggests that uh, this might reflect prenatal um, factors, prenatal biological factors. Some of the critics of this experiment have said, well, you waited 24 hours. Uh, that's plenty of time for postnatal experience to shape these sex differences. And that is, of course, technically true. Uh, but uh, it was the best we could do. Uh, the, the obstetricians where we conducted this study asked us if we would wait for one day whilst the baby and the mother recovered from the birth, and it seemed uh, only reasonable. But um, some people may be persuaded that the fact that this sex difference is appearing so early in development may reflect uh, prenatal biology. So Sven mentioned earlier that uh, our group have been looking at fetal testosterone as a candidate biological factor shaping sex differences and maybe playing a role in autism. Why have we selected fetal testosterone? Well, um, this is the hormone produced by the fetus. Sometimes people think of it as, pr as produced by males, but actually both sexes produce the hormone. It's just that males produce at least twice as much. Uh, the interest for me is not so much the sex difference as simply the variability in the population that we see individual differences, even within males, that are 20-fold. And the question is, why, um, why do people produce such varying amounts, and does it have any functional uh, and structural impact uh, on, on brain development and behavior? And from the animal research, um, testosterone has been thought to have so-called organizational effects on brain development. Organizational is another word for permanent. And uh, we know this from, um, from animal work where you can manipulate fetal testosterone, for example, in rats, and look at the structure of the brain and also at behavior long-term, postnatally. What's found is that if you inject testosterone into the neonate or into um, the amniotic fluid uh, surrounding the fetus, uh, and then later look at uh, the structure of, the, of the, the female rat brain, you find it's been masculinized. It resembles more a typical uh, male brain, male rat brain. And in terms of behavior, you also see this masculinization. So obviously this would be unethical 
to do in humans, uh, but in animal research, uh, it's considered acceptable to manipulate hormone levels prenatally or, or perinatally and look at these effects on behavior. In rats, uh, male rats tend to run through mazes more quickly than female rats, but the treated female rats who've had extra testosterone uh, on average uh, are as fast as their male counterparts. So the hormone seems to be changing both brain and behavior. Um, as you know, uh, the te testosterone, the hormone, is produced by the testes in males. In females, it's produced by the adrenal glands. Uh, it's um, produced by the fetus, as I said. It's carried by the blood and crosses the blood-brain barrier. And the way that testosterone has its effects is by binding to androgen receptors. Testosterone is an androgen. Uh, Androgen receptors are found all over the body, but also in the brain, particularly in those parts of the brain that show the clearest sex differences in terms of structure. And once it's bound to these receptors, it's thought to have the effect on brain development by modulating neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA, and also preventing selective cell death or apoptosis. So there are lots of good reasons to expect that this hormone might be affecting brain development and behavior in humans. Uh, we have been conducting this research in humans in uh, what we think is the most ethical way, which is to take advantage of uh, women who are having amniocentesis during pregnancy. So it would be unacceptable to manipulate hormones. Uh, it would also be unacceptable to measure the hormones uh, in the amniotic fluid produced by the fetus in a random population, but women who are opting to have this clinical procedure where a needle is put into that fluid, they're having it uh, because their doctor has advised them to do this and where uh, it's part of a screening program for Down syndrome, uh, we're asking these women for their consent to also analyze testosterone in that fluid. So this happens in pregnancy. We then wait till after the baby's born and we can look at uh, aspects of behavior in the child and look to see if there's any relationship between prenatal testosterone and uh, later development. So this just shows you, first of all, uh, that we've succeeded in measuring the hormone. This is boys, so male fetuses and female fetuses. And as I mentioned, uh, boys are producing more than girls. But I also mentioned this huge variability there are some boys who are producing so little testosterone that they're in the female range. Equally, there are some girls who are very high in testosterone, so they're in the male range. And the question that this next series of experiments addresses is if we ignore somebody's sex and just look at their hormone levels, what does this predict about their postnatal behavior? At the other side of this slide, you can see uh, a graph that comes from Melissa Hines' book, uh, but uh, which, which really reflects uh, a principle uh, in uh, neuroendocrinology, namely that uh, at birth um, there's very low levels of testosterone being produced, but if we go backwards into fetal life, there's a surge in production of testosterone around the end of the first trimester of pregnancy. You can see there's another small one postnatally at about two or three months old. And if we continued this timeline through to puberty, we would see a third one. And the, the puberty one, we understand its function to do with timing of onset of puberty. But the real question is, why is the fetus producing so much testosterone prenatally? And is, this, uh, is the function of this to do with masculinization of the brain? So here is just some of the data from this longitudinal study. We saw the children at, at their first birthday, 12 months old, and we looked at them in terms of how much eye contact they produced. So these are typical children. They're only in the study because their mothers had amniocentesis. Uh, and what you see is they're filmed whilst they're playing, and we code how often they look up at their mother's face. Girls produce more eye contact than boys in this 10-minute play session. Uh, and when we 
relate this to the prenatal testosterone levels. Here we have hormone levels, here eye contact. In red we've got girls and in blue we have boys. Uh, but there's a negative correlation. So the higher the child's prenatal testosterone, the less eye contact they make at their first birthday. We also saw them at their second birthday, uh, but this time we asked the parents to complete a checklist of vocabulary. How, how many words does your child know and produce? Uh, so again, we see a very clear sex difference in language development, that girls, uh, on average, have a larger vocabulary than boys. This is a finding that's been known about for a long time, that girls talk earlier than boys. Here we have an opportunity to look at mechanisms that might give rise to this because we've got testosterone along the x-axis and again uh, 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 the line slopes downward so it's a negative correlation. The higher the child's fetal testosterone, uh, the smaller their vocabulary at two years old. I'm going to jump now to looking at these children aged eight. We're following these children through their childhood. Uh, and here we've asked the children to take an empathy test, the eyes test, but adapted for children. So the vocabulary um, where you have to pick which word best describes what the person in the photo is thinking or feeling. It's been adapted for a typical eight-year-old child. Um, and here the correct answer is he's interested in something. Uh, but once again we see this negative correlation that the higher the child's fetal testosterone, uh, the more difficulty they're having in reading faces to uh, decode facial expression for underlying emotions or mental states. And when we've asked the parents to complete the EQ, the empathy quotient, about their child, um, uh, I should have said earlier that uh, the hormone data is analysed by the biochemists completely independently to the psychological data. So effectively, um, the parents um, filling in the, in the questionnaire are completely blind to their child's prenatal hormone data. Uh, but what we see is that um, there's a downward correlation again, a negative correlation. So the, child, the higher the child's fetal testosterone, the lower the child is being scored in terms of empathy uh, eight years later. Uh, on this uh, parent report questionnaire. What about systemizing? Now we're seeing the opposite pattern. So the line is going upwards, a positive correlation, uh, that the higher the child's fetal testosterone, the more that the parent is rating the child as uh, having stronger interests uh, in systems of one kind or another. For example, collecting the whole set of something um, systematically, or taking an interest in the small details between different uh, makes of vehicles. Uh, on the embedded figures test, that test of attention to detail, uh, where I told you earlier that there's a sex difference uh, in favour of males, here we're seeing that even if you're ignoring a person's sex and just looking at their hormone status, there's a positive correlation that the higher the child's fetal testosterone, uh, the faster and more accurate they are uh, at uh, the test of attention to detail. And uh, I should also have said that these results uh, are seen both when you look at both sexes together, but also when you look just within one sex. So it's suggesting that this is not just circular, it's not just redescribing sex, but it's actually a hormone effect. Getting closer to the question of interest, is whether there's any relationship between fetal testosterone and autistic traits. So remember that these are children who are typically developing. Uh, each dot is a child, happily running around Cambridge, uh, and uh, there are about 235 children in this study. Because autism is only 1% of the population, it means that a sample of 235 is much too small to look at whether there's any relationship between testosterone and diagnosed autism. You'd need very large samples to do that. Uh, there may be 
one or two children in here who have autism. So instead we can just look at uh, whether there's any relationship between fetal testosterone and autistic traits. And we do this using a questionnaire called the AQ, the Autism Spectrum Quotient, uh, simply because it's a dimensional measure. You can see up here that the AQ, uh, which is in this case a parent report questionnaire, but there's also an adult self-report version, it produces a relatively normal distribution in the general population. So everybody's scoring somewhere on this measure of autistic traits. People with a diagnosis score more extreme, um, so they're shifted over to the right. And so in this sample of typically developing children, we're seeing a positive correlation that the higher the child's fetal testosterone, uh, the more autistic traits the child is showing eight years later when the parents are filling it out. Uh, I'm just going to mention that we have a collaboration with the Biobank in Copenhagen in Denmark because we're very interested to look at whether there's any relationship between fetal testosterone and actual diagnosis. And the reason for the collaboration is that in Copenhagen they've been storing amniotic fluid from um, uh, p women who've had amniocentesis since 1980. And uh, in their freezer, they have 90,000 samples of amniotic fluid. So the other thing about Denmark, uh, many of you will know, is that they have a national uh, register for psychiatric diagnosis. So every new case uh, that's diagnosed is entered into a national register. Uh, and so our collaboration is identifying who has autism in the population, looking back to see if their amniotic fluid is in the freezer, and then doing this analysis for the, the hormone levels. And on that basis, we've been able to identify 400 cases of autism and as many controls as we uh, would, uh, would need. We're taking twice as many controls, and we'll be um, uh, reporting on that data later this year. Uh, this last slide in terms of fetal testosterone is just showing that when you look at fetal testosterone uh, at an even earlier point in development uh, in terms of autistic traits using a parent questionnaire called the QCHAT, the Quantitative Checklist for Autism in Toddlers, again we get this positive correlation that the higher the child's fetal testosterone, the more autistic traits children show. Now that these children are old enough to tolerate MRI, uh, they're eight years old, we've asked them to climb into the scanner and we're looking at brain structure. Uh, and This is the first time it's been studied in humans um, that we've taken the corpus callosum, the connective tissue between the two hemispheres, uh, and looked to see if there's any relationship between different segments of the corpus callosum and testosterone and you can see a positive correlation with rightward asymmetry in just one segment, which is region 4 and the corpus callosum. This is an area where you see sex differences in the general population, uh, that females have a larger uh, um, corpus callosum in this section than males. And here we're seeing um, a, a, a correlation with, uh, with asymmetry in that region. So it's uh, confirming what we know from animal research that this hormone has an effect on brain development. There are some other clues that uh, hormones may be important in autism. I'm not going to go into detail in, in this slide. It's simply to show you from a range of other approaches. We've been looking at fetal testosterone, but you can also look uh, from other sources of evidence. So, for example, the timing of puberty in autism appears atypical, uh, that boys are more likely to go into puberty, boys with autism are more likely to go into puberty slightly early, uh, and girls are more likely to start puberty slightly late. And since the onset of puberty is very much linked to testosterone levels, this suggests that there may be continuing hormonal dysregulation, not just at the fetal stage, but also in terms of current hormones. We've looked at women with Asperger syndrome in terms of testosterone-related medical conditions. For example, PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, 
where individuals have irregular menstrual cycles uh, and uh, they have a late onset of puberty and they have hirsutism or excess bodily hair. So it's quite a common medical condition. Uh, about 10% of the population, of female population, have this. Uh, but uh, this is more common in women with autism or Asperger's syndrome uh, and it's known to be uh, caused by high testosterone levels. Uh, we al we've also looked at testosterone-related characteristics like tomboyism, so the likelihood that as a child girls were playing with male typical toys and again found this is much more common in girls with autism. Many of you know about this measure, the digit ratio, uh, where um, you look at the ratio between the second and fourth fingers, uh, the ring finger versus the index finger, and the ratio is lower in typical males. It's even lower in people with autism, and this, this digit ratio is, correlates with fetal testosterone, so it's often used as a proxy for your hormone levels in the womb. I can see some of you licking at your fingers. <laughs> I should tell you that this, um, the way you have to measure it is putting your hand on a scanner or a photocopier because uh, it's a very small and subtle difference, although if you're an extreme case, you may be able to see it with the naked eye. Um, finally, people have looked at current testosterone uh, either in saliva or in serum uh, or looking at precursors uh, of testosterone, such as androstenedione, finding elevated levels of, the, of these sex steroid hormones in people with autism. And uh, just in the last few minutes, I'll just mention something about the uh, sex steroid genes, because we know that uh, your, how much testosterone you produce um, is a function of uh, many genes, uh, there are at least 25 genes involved in either the production of testosterone uh, or the uh, transport or the receptors for testosterone. And you can see a number of different studies have now started looking at these genes in autism, uh, finding associations. Uh, and um, I'm just going to pick out the androgen receptor gene over here. Um, and here, uh, a whole set of genes that our group has looked at which either, either show association with a formal diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome or with the AQ or EQ. Um, so uh, increasingly there's interest in uh, whether these genes are some of the risk genes uh, for autism. And I should point out, because I don't want um, this kind of data to be misinterpreted, uh, that uh, both the hormonal data and the genetic data uh, may just simply be uh, one part of the causal uh, pathway in autism. I'm certainly not suggesting that hormones are the only factor, uh, but it may be it, that. But this data is suggesting that they're part of uh, the story. So I'm going to um, finish by drawing some conclusions. Uh, I've shown you uh, lots of evidence. I think that there are sex differences on average both in the brain and in the mind in humans, particularly when it comes to the mind in areas like language development, social development, uh, and particularly empathy, uh, and on the non-social side, uh, attention to detail and an interest in systems, and uh, some clues that in autism we may be seeing an extreme of the typical male brain. I think this is uh, really intended as uh, a hypothesis to generate research because there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Uh, for example, there have been very few large-scale studies comparing males and females in autism, and that would be a very straightforward study to do, looking both at structural MRI, DTI, like tractography, and also functional MRI, to be able to test whether females with autism show masculinization of the brain at these different levels. Uh, finally, we've seen some evidence that fetal testosterone is associated with typical sex differences in the population. And uh, I'm hoping uh, that next time I come back, I can tell you about the results of our 
uh, our large co collaborative study with Denmark to see whether this hormone is also involved uh, in the development of autism. So I'd like to uh, invite you to visit our website if you want any more information about these studies and uh, uh, acknowledge the, the, the funding from our uh, sponsors that's enabled this research. Thank you. Thank you.